right so let us continue with our automorphism exercises now here we are given a group g of order 2n g is a group of even order and it is given that half of the elements of g are of order 2 that means there are exactly n elements in g of order 2 and the other half forms a subgroup h which of course is of order n we have to prove that h is of odd order that is this n must be odd and also h is abelian as a group h is abelian the original group g may not be abelian so let's see how one can solve this In the beginning itself, we are going to recall this. Exercise 11 of section, the third section. And the statement of this exercise is this if g is a group of even order then there exists an element a different from the identity element in g such that s square is equal to the identity in other words there is an element a of order two in g if g has even order and we are now going to use this result on h on the subgroup h since no element of h has order 2 because h consists of those elements of g precisely those elements of g that don't have order 2 they have some other order and this uh, result says that any group with even order must have at least one element of order 2 so that means our h cannot have even order of section 2.3 actually I should not write implies but it just directly says so. H has odd order. H must after all have a finite order because it's a subgroup of a finite group so it's either even or odd but uh, even order is not possible because of this so immediately we are getting the conclusion that H has odd order. Now we want to show that H is an abelian subgroup of G. For that, we consider this fact. Note that the index of H in G is what? H 
is by definition order of j divided by order of h. The index is 2. So that means there are two distinct right cosets of h in g. One of these cosets is H and the other is H A for any A belonging to G minus H. So we know because the index is 2, so there are two distinct right cosets. One right coset of always, whatever the case is, uh, will be the subgroup. And the other right coset can be obtained by choosing any element from G minus H, any element in G that is not in H, then you form the coset H A by that element. That will be the other right coset. And because there are only two right cosets. So, irrespective of your choice of A from G minus H, this coset H A that you are getting will be unique. So, if you choose another A prime which is not equal to A, then also you get the same coset that is H A prime will be equal to H A because the index is 2. Okay, now what is the consequence of this fact that will be useful for us? Let us see. This implies this implies that For any A belonging to G minus H and H belonging to H, we have this A H A H, which is A H square equal to E. Why? That is because you see there are two right cosets only. It means what? It means that the original group because we know that the right cosets of a given subgroup in a group partitions the group into disjoint equivalence classes. That we, this we have seen when we proved Lagrange's theorem. So G is a union of H and H A and also H and H A are disjoint. So H consists of those, it is given that H consists of those elements of G that do not have order to. So whatever else G has must all belong to H A. So H A consists of precisely those elements of G that have order to. And that's why. Now how does a general element in H A look like? It looks like H A for some H belonging to H. 
so that means oh i have written it in the opposite order it actually does not matter but since we have considered right coset h a and not left coset so let us take h a order of h a is 2 so its square will be equal to the identity thus now what are we getting from this we get this fact h inverse is equal to From this equation, we get h inverse equal to a h a. For all a belonging to g minus h and for all h belonging to h. Now, now we are going to use this fact to show that um, H is abelian. Since we will not need to change this A, so whatever we are now going to write in that A is fixed. A is some element from G minus H, actually any element works, but we have uh, chosen one element and we are now fixing it. So in uh, what we are going to write now, we will not say again what A is. We know that A is some element from G minus A. Now for any two elements H1 and H2 in H, we have H1, H2 inverse equal to you see because h is given to be a subgroup so h1 h2 is again an element in h so this equation tells us that h1 h2 inverse is a h1 h2 a and that is because this equation is true for all h belonging to h now, can I write this thing as this product a h1 h a h2 uh, I mean a h1 a and a h2 a product of these two elements. I can but what is the uh, why because in the middle we will have a square and a is an element that is not in h that means a has order 2 because the elements that are not in h are precisely the elements that have order 2 so a square will be identity and it will vanish leaving us with this so we have got this again if we use this equation uh, to these two elements then we get h1 inverse and that one is h2 inverse but we know that in any group this is equal to h2 h1 whole inverse so these two inverses are equal so the original elements will also be equal But this implies H1, H2 equal to H2, H1. Hence, H is abelian.
and that completes the solution. Note that we actually have not used any uh, result about automorphism in this solution. So maybe the author uh, had such a solution in mind which uses some result about automorphism and maybe that solution is much shorter and easier than this. If you come up with some such solution, please let me know. There is a star also on this exercise, so it's supposed to be harder than the usual ones. Of course, uh, once we see the solution, see it once or two times or three times, it slowly becomes easy for us. So. This star has some significance. The author must have thought about one solution which uses automorphisms and that gets the job done in a much shorter manner. However, to come up with that, I think uh, we need to think a lot. So maybe that's why he has put star. Don't know. The thing is that if you find one such solution, please, I would like to see that. Then the next one, let phi of n be, be the Euler phi function. If a is a is an integer that is greater than one, if this is an integer, prove that n divides the phi value of the integer a to the power n minus 1. Okay. Let's see what we can do here. When you see such things, definitely in the beginning you are in, in darkness unless the thing is extremely easy and something that you already know. If you are being asked to solve something like this, you start off with knowing almost nothing. Almost nothing means you don't know what you are supposed to do, but then slowly you get ideas. One thing that you can see in this exercise is that the exercise as it stands, it doesn't have any group or anything. But we want to prove that something divides something else. An integer divides another integer. So that gives you an idea that somehow you have to use Lagrange's theorem. Because that is the only result so far we have seen which has a divisibility condition and that is the idea that will work here. So that means what? Using Lagrange's theorem or one of its corollaries means that you should come up with a group which has this order and then maybe a subgroup having order n then automatically by Lagrange's theorem, n will divide this. Or you come up with a group with this order and an element in that group of this order. 
then also by uh, the second second corollary or first corollary i can't remember exactly the, that also will imply that this divisibility relation is true and that's what we have in this solution And the nature of this integer tells you what type of group you can take here that will work. Consider the group u a to the power n minus 1. Why? Because We know that the order of this group is this integer. Now we seek an element in this group that has order n. Note that a to the power n minus 1 times a plus minus 1 times a to the power n minus 1 is what? This is a to the power n and this is minus a to the power n. They will give us 0 and minus 1 minus 1 is plus 1. So it tells you what? It tells you that a to the power n minus 1 and a to the power n minus 1 are relatively prime. And hence, the greatest common divisor of this and, oh, do we need a to the power n minus 1 or do we need a? a is the element that we will see has order n. So, this same equation also tells us that a and this thing are relatively prime, that is their greatest common divisor is 1. And since they are relatively prime, so the congruence class modulo a to the power n minus 1 that contains a is an element in this group. So what I said just now that A has order N is uh, not exactly correct. This element has order N because technically speaking this is not even an element in this group. It is just an ordinary integer. Okay, Now we want to show that it has order N. One can see that. this equation is true in this group. Why? What is the meaning of this equation? The meaning of this equation is if you simplify the situation, it just tells you that the congruence class containing the integer a to the power n and the one containing the integer one are equal. That means this is congruent to one mod. Don't forget what the modulus is. This is the modulus. Is this congruence true? It is true because what, what does this congruence uh, demand? It demands that a to the power n minus 1 be 
divisible by a to the power n minus 1 which is of course true because they are equal so that's why this is true and as a consequence this is true so we have shown that the nth power of this integer i mean uh, this congruence class is the identity element of this group now if we can show that no uh, smaller integer makes this equation true then n will be the order of this element suppose there exists an integer r lying between 1 and n minus 1 we have to consider positive integer because order is never zero by definition such that the rth power of this element is also equal to the identity. If this is true for some r, then n will not be the order. The order will be, uh, it will come down. It will be less than or equal to r. This implies one or congruent to one modulo this or which in turn it means this integer is dividing this integer But this is not possible. Why is it not possible? Because R is positive is the the only case in which this could have happened in spite of R being less than N is the case where R is equal to 0. Because in that case, this integer will become 0. A to the power R will become 1. 1 minus 1 is 0 and 0 is divisible by any non-zero integer but that also is not possible here because r is positive this is but have i uh, provided something else also here as explanation no nothing much more than just this line because of these inequalities thus our last supposition is wrong And hence, order of this element is equal to n. Now we have all the things we need. All the pieces are available to us. So oh, that is corollary 2. So by Corollary 2 to
Lagrange's theorem. This order divides the order of the group. I e n divides phi of a to the power n minus one. So that completes the solution. Then seventeen. Let G be a group and C be the center of G. I will keep on writing C E N T R E. Okay, if that uh, uh, it uh, looks weird to you, you can use C E N T E R. If T is any automorphism of G. Oh, before I uh, leave this previous exercise, let me just make one comment about this notation. You see, uh, we have been consistently writing arguments to the left of the function name, right? Uh, in this uh, algebra book, that is, instead of writing f of x, we are writing x f. However, for uh, well-known functions like this Euler's phi function or some such other function, we write phi of n because that's how it is usually written. It's, it, uh, I mean, uh, I should not say this function belongs to Euler, but since he studied it, so it's a way of honoring him. This usually is not written like this, n phi. Okay, so we will uh, make an exception to the practice of always writing functions like this in this type of uh, cases, in this type of situations. Okay, so now in this one, we are given a group G and its center is given. If T is any automorphism, have we written any? Okay. Then, uh, the center is invariant under T. Prove that so this is the image of the center under the function T is contained in this. Is it just contained in this or equal to this? Uh, it's uh, given that it's contained in this. Okay, let us first prove this and then we will think of equality, which is, although it's not given in this exercise, but we will think of it. So, uh, the situation is very straightforward now. 
what do we have to show? We have to take an element from this image and prove that that element belongs to the center. That means that element commutes with every element of the group. So let Z be any element in the center. we need to show that this image belongs to the center. Let G be any element in G. We will now uh, show that set T or ZT commutes with G. Since T is onto, T is an automorphism, so it's besides being a homomorphism, it is uh, al both also both one one and onto. So since T is onto. G is equal to H T for some element H in G. Now we calculate this product G set T. This is equal to H T set T. You can probably now see what, where this calculation is going. Because T is a homomorphism, this is equal to the T image of HZ. But Z is a central element, so Z will commute with H. Again use the fact that T is a homomorphism and write it as Z T h t and finally h t is g so z t commutes with g thus and hence This is contained in Z. Okay. Now we were saying that we want to see whether this is also contained in this. Is every element? Oh yes, that will be the case, no? But. Uh, it will be the case because T is one to one and on to and we have this containment or this inclusion but exactly why? If you take an element from here says that prime the question is can you write Z prime as an element, I mean as the T image of some element of Z? Mm -hmm. Z prime of course is the T image of some element of Z, I mean some element of G because T is onto, much like how G is the T image of some element of G. So we do have this z prime is equal to say z double prime t where z double prime belongs to g. But the question is, is this z double prime a central element? Now that is a different thing. Huh? 
we can however write from this equation because t is bijective this thing now if one wants to show that z double prime is a central element can one do that let's just think for a moment you again take an arbitrary element because it is here taken for us so let g be any element in g and because t is onto g again is ht for some h in g now we want to show that z double prime commutes with g oh but uh, we want to cleverly uh, not use this one but something else and the thing is that when t is an automorphism its inverse is also because t is bijective its inverse first of all exists and is bijective and t inverse is also an automorphism so we did not need to go like that T is an automorphism means what? T belongs to the automorphism group of G. So its inverse exists in the automorphism group. That means the inverse is also an automorphism. And because of that, this G that we have chosen from G uh, can be written like this, say G prime T inverse. Whatever we have done here for t we can do for t inverses because that is also an automorphism okay now what happens to this calculation in place of this we can put z prime t inverse here we can put g prime t inverse now since t inverse is a homomorphism uh, the calculation will continue like this From here, we can write z prime g prime t inverse. And because our z prime originally came from the center, so it commutes with, I think uh, we will, it will uh, continue without any, without any hitch. So in place of z prime, so z prime will commute with g prime. And then if you unwind things, g prime t inverse, z prime t inverse. So this will be what? g prime t inverse is g and z prime t inverse is z double prime. So we see that this is that double prime actually is coming from the center and that's why okay so that's why this z prime which is z double prime t this belongs to this because z double prime now has been shown to belong to the center so this inclusion is also true and as a result you can extend this solution and if you continue like this using this extra part and this one you can claim that this is actually equal to the center okay so if one uh, continues the solution one can conclude equality not just in 
inclusion. Anyway, let us now move on. Exercise 18 next. Let G be a group and P an automorphism of G. Uh, and uh, do you observe something else also about the previous exercise? Since T is any automorphism, this inclusion tells us that the center is a characteristic subgroup of G. Let G be a group. T an automorphism of G. If for A belonging to G, in a uh, so Herstein is again defining we already have seen this this is the normalizer of the element a which by definition is the set of those elements in the group that commute with this fixed element a that is x belonging to g such that a x equal to x a we know that n a is a subgroup of G. We already have seen these facts. Prove that N A T is equal to is equal to what? N A n of a t. Let us first see the meaning of this equation. On the left hand side we have normalizer of the element a t. On the right hand side we have the t image of the normalizer of a. These two things are equal that we have to show. G is any group, there is no restriction on G and T is any automorphism of G and A is also any element in G. So it, it is that generally. So uh, basically we have to show that these two sets are equal. So let us show that each one of them is a subset of the other. Let G belong to N A T. Okay. Then immediately that tells us that the element G and the element A T commute with each other. That means G A T is equal to A T G. Now since T is an automorphism like before, it is onto onto so G will be equal to H T for some element H in the group G. If we can now prove that this H belongs to N A, then G has been proved to be the T image of some element from N A and as a consequence G will belong to this. So we will have one of the inclusions. Now we aim to show that H actually commutes with A that is H belongs to N A. Let us use this here in this equation. 
then ht at is equal to we are using this equation in place of g we are writing ht on this side we have a t h t or since t is a homomorphism h a t equal to a h t now t besides being a homomorphism and onto is also one to one. We are now going to use that. Since T is one to one or injective, the last equation above gives us H A equal to A H. Thus, H actually belongs to NA, the thing that we wanted to show. And hence, G, which is HT, this belongs to the T image of the normalizer of A. We have thus shown that the normalizer of A T is contained in the image of the normalizer of A under T. Now the reverse inclusion which you need in order to conclude equality I am leaving to you. One can I need ink. one can similarly prove that the normalizer of AT contains that is, is a superset of the T image of the normalizer of A. So they are equal. This completes the, actually it does not complete the solution because we have left this uh, incomplete. So it's up, it's left to you. And I believe you can, uh, much like we have shown this one, you can easily show this one also. You will take an element from here 
you will have to prove that that element belongs to the normalizer of AT that means that element commutes with AT that's all you have to show next Nineteen. Let G be a group and T an automorphism of G. If N is a normal subgroup of G, such that the T image of N is contained in N. This condition, uh, there is a way of expressing this. When this happens, we say that T e, n is invariant under T. Show how you could use T. to find or to define Define an automorphism of G by N, the quotient group G by N. Is that what the author, yeah. Uh, T to define now there is an issue with this exercise let's uh, start the solution and then we will see what goes wrong in the middle somewhere we are straight away going to define the function that we feel should be an automorphism define s from g by n to but before that let's see what we are given the hypothesis is this g is the group T is an automorphism of G and N is a normal subgroup of G that is invariant under T. We should use this information to somehow define an automorphism of the quotient group G by N because N is normal so the quotient makes sense. So define S from G by N to G by N by this. So that means now we our inputs are cosets of n in g. So they will look like this. You can if you want you can take a left coset here also. It will not uh, make a difference because n is normal. So every left coset is equal to the corresponding right coset. Now the s image of this is defined to be 
see this the image again should belong to g by n g slash n that is it should be again a right coset of n and somehow we have to use t so what could be more natural than to define s like this here we have started with the right coset ng of n in g and we have ended up with this this is again a right coset of n in g and we have used t also note that because t is an automorphism of g gt again is an element in g so this actually is a right coset of n in g because this gt is coming from g okay now having defined s our next job is to show that s is well defined there is no problem uh, of s i mean there uh, there is no problem in whether s maps elements into this set we can see that that is the case whatever ng is this image belongs to g by n now we need to show that for a given ng this image is unique so let g1 and g2 be two elements in g such that these two right cosets are equal so now uh, we want to show that their s images should also be equal then when this happens we have g1 g2 inverse belongs to n we have already seen these things when we studied subgroups and cosets of subgroups okay now we use the this inclusion that uh, the fact that n is invariant under t this implies that the t image of g1 g2 inverse belongs to n in brackets you can write the reason since this is true so you take any element from n in this case this element apply t to that element the image will again belong to n that's what we have written thus but uh, this can be written in a different manner because t is a homomorphism like this inverse and this in turn implies that these two right cosets of n are equal in this step uh, we have taken we have gone uh, i mean or in other words we have done the opposite to what we have done here ng1 ng2 being equal implies g1 g2 inverse belongs to n and the converse is also true this times this inverse belongs to n means the corresponding right cosets are equal thus
n g1 s by definition is this which has been shown to be equal to this and this again by definition of s is ng to s so equal inputs have given us equal outputs hence s is well defined next we try to show that s is a homomorphism for that we take two elements in the domain group apply s on them on their product and see if we get the condition that we want for homomorphism for n a n b belonging to g by n we have in a n b s first of all inside we have this this calculation of course has been carried out in this quotient group and now by the definition of s this is equal to n a b t this it's the right coset of n by the element a b t t is an automorphism so it's a homomorphism so we can write a t b t again if we think of this in the group g by n we can write n a t times n b t and this is n a s times n b s so that's it we have shown that as the homomorphism So two more things are there to show. S now we have to show that S is on to and one to one. If we are able to do that, then S will be an automorphism of G by N. For any n c belonging to g by n we have of course c must have come from g now since t is an automorphism of g so t is on to So C is equal to D T for some T belonging to G. Then 
this arbitrarily chosen nc from g by n where in this context you should think of g by n as this second one so now we are trying to show that our function capital s is on to so we need to show that this nc is the s image of something from the domain g by n so we are doing all these things for that something now nc is n dt and by the definition of s this is nothing but the s image of n d where definitely n d belongs to g by n so s is onto so next and the only job left is to show that s is one to one but here there is a problem we now address an issue with the exercise in the following paragraph. So we have been able to show that the function S we have chosen is a homomorphism and it is onto. What I am now going to say may not, uh, I mean it will be a sort of opinion rather than something definite, a remark about this exercise. We will see why it is only an opinion of mine and nothing more than that. Note that the function S defined in the previous paragraph is in a sense the easiest and most natural function Or and let me change the words a bit. Natural candidate for a homomorphism. G by N. However, it is not necessarily one to one. 
I mean that is the only thing we are yet to show uh, that was left. One to oneness or injectivity was not shown. We have only shown that our S is onto and is a homomorphism. Now a case is there where this does not happen. Take G equal to Q the group of rational numbers under ordinary addition of rational numbers. We know that it's a group. In fact, it's an abelian group. Let n be the subgroup of integers. The integers form a subgroup of this group naturally. Define T from Q to Q by this formula. Every rational number is mapped by T onto its double to R. Now you can easily show that this T is a homomorphism. Keep in mind that the group has addition of rational numbers as its binary operation. So to prove that this is a homomorphism, we just have to show this. Say R1 and R2 are two rational numbers. Their T image will be what? Like using the fact that um, we have the left distributive now you can write it like this so which is r1 t plus r2 t so t is a homomorphism also t is one to one right and t is on to why is t one to one that is because uh, if you have different rational numbers then their doubles are also different so distinct inputs have distinct outputs so it's one to one or if you can also show that if r1 and r2 are two rationals for which the outputs are equal then the inputs are equal because you can then cancel two from both sides so this t is a homomorphism it's one to one is it onto? Yes, it is onto. You choose an arbitrary rational number S. You can express it as 2 times S divided by 2. So that means this is the T image of S divided by 2. And S divided by 2 is again a rational number. So you have shown that T is homomorphism 1 to 1 and onto. That means T is an automorphism of the additive group of rational numbers. So we write all these things. I mean the final conclusion of all these things. One can see that T belongs to the automorphism group of this group. That means T is an automorphism of Q. Also, what is the image of the set of integers under T? So we will double all the integers. The double of every integer 
uh, will be there and they will uh, comprise the set Tz and they are again integers so this is nothing but a set that is contained in set so you can now see that all the conditions all the hypothesis of the exercise are true in this situation we have a group we have a subgroup which note that is a normal subgroup of q because the group anyway is abelian so every subgroup is a normal subgroup and this is an automorphism of t under which this normal subgroup is invariant and now if one considers the function s that we have defined in this solution in this particular case then that is just like uh, what we have shown in general that s is a homomorphism of q by z which is on to but unfortunately it's not one to one the function s defined in the previous paragraph in this particular situation is not one to one because these two images are equal but the inputs themselves are not equal let us try to understand what we have written here why are these two things equal let us apply first the definition of s in this particular situation and uh, note that this is a coset so in place of ng now you have in place of n you have this z and in place of g you have a rational number and since the binary operation is addition so we are writing like this so ng of s by definition is um, n g t so that means n g t that means n plus of course we have to write this so equality of these two things means this and this is equivalent to what is this we have we are doubling all the rational numbers right so if you double this you will get 3 divided by 2 and this one is 1 divided by 2 if you double 1 over 4 are these two cosets equal they will be equal if and only if the difference of the elements that are giving us these cosets 
belongs to Z. In other words, this is what? 3 minus 1 divided by 2, that is 1. This is a true statement. So that means these equivalent statements are also true and consequently these two S images are equal. However, this, these two are not equal. Why? Because just like this one, if you calculate the difference, it will be 2 divided by 4 and this does not belong to the set of integers. So you see that in this particular case, the S that we are trying to show in general is not one to one. So our S has failed. Now it can mean two things. First of all, the S that we have chosen is actually the S that is supposed to be chosen. That's why we are writing, note that the function S defined in the previous paragraph is in a sense the easiest and most natural candidate for a homomorphism on G by N. Or this is not what uh, we are supposed to do. That is the other possibility. So that's why I am saying this part is only my opinion. This part is my opinion. Maybe there is another more natural way of defining S using maybe not T but something else that involves T. Maybe T inverse Maybe one can define S like this. I don't know, I have not gone through this other possibility. G T inverse. Or maybe one can define N G T inverse. Maybe one of these things will work, will give us a homomorphism that is not only one to one but on to thus an automorphism of g by n but the present s is not working now if it turns out that the author had this s itself in mind that we have written here and we are we were trying to show that it's an automorphism then this problem in this exercise is wrong otherwise if one of these things works then the exercise is of course fine i will go through these things and see if any of them works or uh, maybe something else entirely which which is again it involves t but in a slightly more complicated manner maybe that works so until we find that thing we will not so it's a really unfortunate situation. We won't be able to settle this exercise until we find one such S that works. Or uh, this is highly unlikely or maybe we can somehow show that such an S does not exist then you can say that this uh, exercise has an issue what i was saying in the middle of the solution so it's really a i mean what can i say a sort of failure on my part actually so what now you are uh, being asked to do is you try to find an S that may work by trying these other variations of S. So this exercise remains incomplete in this form. The most natural and easiest candidate 
there is no doubt that the S we have defined is actually the most natural and easiest candidate for a homomorphism on G by N. But being a candidate and being the real thing, there is a difference between those two. So our guess has not worked. So it's now up to you and up to me also. I will also look through these things, but it will take some time. So let's move on. Let's leave this exercise and let's move on. There is something else that can be said about this exercise also, although I am not sure whether I should say it. The thing is that instead of this condition, if one assumes the stronger hypothesis, then one actually can show that the S yes, we have chosen works. In that case, it becomes uh, a, an automorphism of G by N. However, the example that we have uh, come up with here that clearly shows that with the same condition and with the same S uh, there is no guarantee that the S will be one to one. But I should not just simply because one S has failed I should not change the exercise like this. I don't have a right to do that. Not yet, only after investigating the matter thoroughly and after seeing no one knows how many possibilities for S and slowly realizing that nothing works, then only you can think of this, changing the hypothesis to this. If instead of this you take this, then uh, the solution uh, can be continued to show that our S itself is one to one also. Use the discussion following lemma 283. construct a a non abelian group of order fifty five and B of order 203. So it's that part where we started with an arbitrary group which uh, 
as an automorphism T of some finite order R, which is not an inner automorphism, we then used these two objects to create that non-abelian group, which uh, we are denoting by, by this notation, which has G as a normal subgroup in it. And this quotient is isomorphic to the cyclic group generated by T. So it's that part. We have to now use that discussion. In fact, we have gone through this in full detail and we have shown that whatever is claimed in the text about these things, all of them are true. So now we have to use this discussion to construct non-abelian groups of order 55 and 203. So that means in each case we have to take an appropriate group G, find an appropriate homomorphism uh, T, which I mean an automorphism T which is not an inner automorphism and which has finite order and all those things and then uh, don't be afraid we won't have to go through all the details that we went through when we showed that these things are true we now we know for a fact that such a group exists and we also know how to calculate its order we will need that thing only that much of this discussion the order is important So the thing starts like this, consider the cyclic group G of order 11 generated by some element a is there. Okay, so this is our G. Define a function t from g into g by mapping any arbitrary element of g onto this. One can show that this is a well-defined map and it's a homomorphism. To show that this is a homomorphism, you just have to use the uh, rules of exponents. That's all. It's very easy. T is a well defined. Now note that because G is a finite set and T is a mapping from G into G. So one to oneness of T will imply its ontoness and vice versa. And that fact is coming from a, an exercise that we came across in the section on functions way back when we started things. So it's enough for us to show that T is one to one. If 
and because uh, we have claimed that one can show that t is a homomorphism now to show that it's one to one it's enough to show that its kernel consists of only the identity element if a to the power i belonging to g belongs to the kernel of t then its t image will be equal to identity this implies now if you just look at this equation a to the power 3i is equal to e then we know that it says that the order of a divides the exponent 3i and because a is a generator of this cyclic group which has order 11 so a has order 11 so this implies 11 which is order of a divides 3i and hence 11 divides i why because 3 and 11 are relatively prime so from basic properties of uh, integers and divisibility relation in the set of integers 11 should divide i think it's that uh, this result that we are using here it's named euclid's lemma yes so 11 divides i since we have chosen our a to the power i from g so i lies between uh, i actually you can take i to be any integer not just in this range between 0 and 10 but we can take i also in this range taking a larger i does not uh, give us anything new and to be specific you can write here one extra part where i lies between 0 and 10 belongs to the kernel of uh, t then these things happen since So in this range there is only one i that 11 divides that is 0. Thus the kernel of t consists of only the identity element hence t is one to one and as a consequence t is also on to and the result that we were talking about from the first chapter is this by exercise 8b of section 1.2 1 2 
So T is a homomorphism and it's bijective. Thus T is an automorphism of G. We will now have to uh, measure the order of T in this as an element of this automorphism group. Now, note that these calculations are true for T. T of course itself is not the identity automorphism that we can see from this definition itself. For example, if you apply T on A, you get A cube and A cube is not equal to A because if A cube is equal to A, then the order of A cannot be 11. So, A is not fixed by T. So, how can T be the identity automorphism? So, that, that is understood. We are not writing that. We show that some higher powers of T are also not the identity automorphism. Note that A T square, if we apply uh, T twice on A, then the first time we will get a cube, the second time we will get the cube of a cube that is a to the power 9 and this is not equal to a like that a t cube will be a to the power 27. You can see that because the order is 11, so a to the power 11 whole square. Let me show at least this one times a to the power 5. Now this becomes identity, so we are left with a to the power 5 and that is also not equal to a. So just like t square, t cube also fails to keep A fixed. So, T cube cannot be the identity automorphism. Then, A T to the power 4 turns out to eventually be equal to A fifth. Again, I am repeating these things. Okay. Whenever you see calculations are uh, like this, uh, you know how bad I am with this numerical calculations you should always verify these things on your own and see whether they uh, whether what i have written is actually true numerically and this is a to the power 4 because 11 plus 4 is 15 and that is not equal to a hence t to the power i is not the identity automorphism for all integers i lying between 1 and 4. But t to the power 5 is the identity automorphism. Now for i lying between 0 and 10, so this is a general element from the group on which we are applying t to the power 5. So we will be applying t 5 times. That means 3 to the power 5. You apply it once, it will be a to the power 3i apply it twice a to the power 3 square i apply it 5 times a to the power 3 to the power 5 times i that means 243 i and 
one can see that this is equal to a to the power i why though if you this means what a to the power 242 i is equal to identity that will be the case if 242 is divisible by 11 and that is divisible by 11 so you get this so t to the power 5 plays the uh, actually it is equal to the identity automorphism so We have thus proved that the order of t is 5. Okay. So that means we have a group of order 11 in which we have found an automorphism of order 5. Now is this automor- oh I okay I think I forgot one aspect of this of that discussion entirely. Not only do we need these things but the automorphism should not be an inner automorphism. Okay, so that thing have, has been left out. Can we prove that this T is not an inner automorphism? Because if we don't have that, then we will get a group of order 55 because um, our original group has order 11 and this automorphism has order 5. So the group that we will construct uh, in that discussion that will have order 55 but it will not be non-abelian necessarily. Okay, showing that this automorphism is not an inner automorphism means what? If it's an inner automorphism, then say it is T a to the power j. Say it's the inner automorphism corresponding to a to the power j. It should correspond to some element of the group. Hmm. Then by the definition, this will be equal to a to the power j inverse a a to the power j okay oh am i missing something obvious here uh, our group is abelian so if 
say you have an abelian group not this g but uh, let me digress for a moment let us take a general abelian group g and let us take an element g in g and let's consider the inner automorphism tg corresponding to g then for any element h in g what is the image of h under tg g inverse h g by the definition of tg but our group is abelian so h and g inverse they commute and we will get h okay so you see that in an abelian group any inner automorphism is actually the identity automorphism yes so because our group is abelian and the automorphism we have defined is not the identity automorphism so it cannot be an inner automorphism yes so that obstacle is overcome it in fact it's not there at all but we need to mention it since g is abelian and t is not the identity automorphism t is not an inner automorphism of g hence the group g comma t from that discussion is a non abelian group of order the order of the group times the order of this automorphism that is 55 so that's how we have obtained a non abelian group of order 55 okay now next part b this also is similar but the numbers are different let g equal to p this time let's take uh, b another generator p to the power 28 p the cyclic group of order 29 define t from g to g by okay so this time we are going to uh, define it like this okay instead of taking that same t let us take s the s image of b to the power i is b to the power 7i just like before one can show that s is a well defined homomorphism let p to the power i belonging to g belong to the 
kernel of S where this time we are going to carefully write that thing that I lies in this range. What is the range now? 0 and 28. Then p to the power 7i which is the s image of b to the power i must be equal to the identity because b to the power i belongs to the kernel. There are so many things left for us to learn and we are crawling here but that's the way things are in mathematics unless we go through this unless we walk this arduous road unless we persevere we won't reach anywhere truly speaking we cannot take a arbitrary jumps skip over things and then expect that we will land somewhere very nice we will land somewhere very nice but we won't understand anything if we uh, reach that place prematurely so this is the only way then this is equal to e this implies The order of B divides 7i, which is 29. 29 is a prime, so it's relatively prime to 7, which is a different prime. Hence, the Euclid's lemma 29 divides i. Thus, I must be equal to 0 and so the kernel of S consists of this hence T is 1 to 1 and as a consequence on to also we know where this is coming from from that exercise 8b of section 1.2 but we are not going to refer to that again we have done it once in this solution in part a thus S is an automatic. Oh, yes, we have written that one can show that it's a homomorphism. Automorphism of G. Next, uh, the calculations to uh, find the order of S. Note that. P S square equal to S square that means 7 will come twice P to the power 49 29 so that means 29 plus 20 so P to the power 29 which is not equal to B so S square is not the identity automorphism p s cube is b to the power 140 which is b to the power 24 and that is also not equal to b p s 
to the power 4 is equal to p to the power 168 which turns out to be equal to p to the power 20. I hope you uh, know what we are doing here. We are using the fact that B has order 29. So using that we are reducing this exponent as much as possible. So the final exponents that you see here all of them are less than 29. After reaching that stage you cannot reduce any further unless B of course is some special type of element. So this is again not equal to B. Had it been B, the order of B would not have been 29. Okay, and then, so that means S to the power 4 also fails to be the identity of automorphism. Is there, uh, okay, it goes on. B, S to the power 5. So things are going on increasing. 161 I bet the original uh, number that comes here is higher than 161 because here itself we have got 168 this is after some reduction initial reduction and then further we are reducing and we get 16 which also is not P. So this also is not the identity automorphism. And finally, we have to calculate the sixth power also. This also is after uh, some initial reduction has become this. And then on further reduction, we get 25, which is not equal to B. Thus, p to the power j is not the identity of, oh sorry, not b, s to the power j for all s, uh, all j lying between 1 and 6. Now for any integer i line between 0 and 28, what is the seventh power of s doing to this element? 7 to the power 7. Now, so here for the first time we have written the full number I think. It becomes 8, 2, 3, 5, 4, 3, i. And this turns out to be equal to a to the power i. Showing that s to the power 7 is nothing but the identity automorphism. Please verify these calculations. Thus, s to the power 7 is the identity automorphism. We have thus shown that the order of S is 7 this time. T had order 5 in the previous part.
spins g is abelian and s is not equal to i s is thus not an inner automorphism of g hence for this g and this s this is a non abelian group of order the order of g times the order of s order of g here is 29 order of s is 7 203 so that's how we have a non abelian group of order 203 and finally this last exercise let g be a group of order 9 generated by the again he is using group presentation theory the elements a and b where a q equal to b q equal to e we discussed somewhat about the problem with this groups that have been discussed uh, about in the text namely the problem is that the way the groups have been given they use presentation theory at that point i said that i will say something superficial about presentation theory the thing is that you see so far we have seen only one way of making sense of a group making sense in the uh, properly speaking one way of presenting a group saying what its elements are and what its operations are and what is that way we are given a set we come up with a binary operation on the set we show that this structure is a group and that's how we know about one such group another way of presenting a group is to say that there are some abstract symbols that will be used in the group and those symbols themselves are not elements of the group but those symbols are used to form the elements of the group just like uh, in this group for example we considered some symbols which look like this x to the power i a to the power j or in the general case this so x and g are some abstract symbols which are being used to uh, say what the elements in the group are and those symbols are supposed to satisfy some relations which are given in advance now the group that this uh, presentation theory says for example here itself you can see g is a group of order 
generated by the elements A and B. These elements are not elements of some group because we don't have a group to begin with. We just have two abstract symbols A and B which has which have a relationship like this. Okay, that they are supposed to satisfy. Now the question is this what is the freest group that one can think of where these conditions are true. That is, what is the group in which these are elements and there are other elements that can be generated from these elements in some sense and where these uh, relations are true and nothing else is there. It's the freest group given these restrictions. Presentation theory shows that always there are such groups and for a given set of generators and a set of relations, there is always such a group. So, in fact, there is nothing vague or in fact wrong about writing a group like this. This precisely says uh, what the group is. However, because we have not encountered presentation theory, so this is big for us at this stage. Whatever I, I have said now, it's very vague and uh, it is not rigorous at all in any sense. But you can sort of try to understand what I am saying here. You are given some symbols that you are given some relations that those symbols are supposed to satisfy. In this scenario, what is the freest possible group that uh, will take all these things into account and nothing else? There is a the free group that is a technical term in group theory. Okay, it has a specific meaning. So that means uh, we now have to somehow make sense of this group. We have to say what this group actually is because then only we can uh, proceed further. And what do we have to do here? Find. all the automorphisms of G. You can argue, okay, Lucifer, why don't you, why don't we go to presentation theory, learn it, and then these things will be easy. But no, we will not immediately jump to those uh, advanced parts. We will go according to this book. We will see what we can do, given uh, whatever we have been provided with. And then we will go to the advanced parts. Let us first struggle here. Uh, let us familiarize ourselves with these things. And then only we can appreciate the advanced parts. And through these struggles, we will know what the advanced part should have and why it was constructed in the first place. Here, now I am directly going to write what the group is, but its justification uh, will have to wait because it uses something from this book itself, which however is available much later. this section 2 
13. So it turns out that this group is nothing but J3 cross J3. Let me tell you in, in this situation what J3 cross J3 is or in fact what is the meaning of the Cartesian product of two groups. Say you have two groups then you can consider their underlying sets and you can form the Cartesian product. On this Cartesian product there is a very natural operation under which the product itself becomes a group and the operation is simply this. If you have two ordered pairs from here then their product is defined to be this order pair g2 g2 prime where the product between g1 and g1 prime is the one we have in g1 the binary operation in g1 why because g1 and g1 prime are coming from g1 so this again will be an element in g1 and this product makes sense like that since g2 and g2 prime are coming from g2 so this is their product in g2 and this is now an operation on g1 cross g2 under which g1 cross g2 becomes a group in a very straightforward manner this is that group j3 cross j3 or in the more universal notation c3 cross c3 and why g is in the, uh, this particular g is actually nothing but this group for that of course you need section 213 okay from results uh, from that section we can conclude that g must be equal to this nothing else up to isomorphism So this is direct product and this group that we have here it is semi direct product we will see why semi and why direct and what is the relationship between these two groups okay let us now proceed for simplicity we shall denote the element we shall denote the element belonging to G by C alpha beta. Okay, what is this final line? You see, our group is z3 cross z3 so according to the notation of this book a single equivalence class modulo 3 looks like this where alpha is some ordinary integer belonging to that congruence class because we will be dealing with 
ordered pairs of such congruence classes. So a general element in G will look like this. If we strictly follow the notation. But it's cumbersome to keep writing these things. So instead, we will denote the same thing by this simpler notation C suffix alpha beta. Now we will try to uh, see what sort of automorphisms can this group have. Let T be any automorphism of G. Then for any C alpha beta belonging to G, we have C alpha beta T equal to, if you look at the things carefully, it becomes C10 alpha or uh, okay uh, yeah first of all we will have one zero and then zero one beta t and because c is a homomorphism alpha times c is zero one t beta what is this calculation now? See, although we are using some uh, different notation, but this has become quite confusing. So we have to go back to the original clumsy notation and for once we should understand with what we are writing here. Can you not write in the group J3 cross J3 this element as this product? Because the binary operation that we have shown just now on this product According to that operation, you have to take the product of the first coordinates and the product of the second coordinates. But keep in mind that the groups we have, the individual groups, the factor groups, or oh, I should not say the factor groups, the parts of this product, they are abelian groups and in them the operations are, in both of them the operation is addition modulo 3. So, this, if you go in the opposite direction, will be this, just this product, which is nothing but 